It is now my privilege to bring to you Mr. Hans Minniger and his paper, Human All to Human, an Exploration of the Skepticism of David Hume from a Christian Perspective. Skepticism is a philosophical perspective that doubts the certainty of human knowledge. The covert instinctive biases of human thought give the skeptic pause in reflecting on rational discourse. When intelligent thinkers argue logically and persuasively, yet advocate directly opposite conclusions, one wonders how reason can seem simultaneously accurate and inconclusive. Can Platonic idealism really persuade? Given man's rational deficiency and deceit, such reflections on the nature of thought or epistemology are what color vividly David Hume's famous work, A Treatise of Human Nature. A uniquely approachable skeptic, Hume is an excellent sounding board for Christians curious about how skepticism can impact their perspective on human thought. Yet additionally to articulating thoughts characteristic of a generic skeptic, Hume's distinctive blend of honesty and clarity, coupled with his critique of reason's sovereignty, make for unique reflections in their own right. What are the strengths and weaknesses of Hume's critical philosophy? How can a Christian learn from, yet also overcome them, rising to a better understanding of biblical anthropology on the stepping stones of unbiblical empiricism? To answer these questions, it will first be necessary to summarize the distinctives of Hume's treatise, to see how its perspective on humanity so clearly resonates with Nietzsche's desire of the heart made abstract. Because Hume believes that experience, not reason, is the foundation of knowledge, he tends to doubt philosophers such as Plato, who hold that belief is grounded in knowledge of the form world and its regulative truths. On the contrary, Hume argues that belief is experientially and emotionally determined, defining it as a lively idea related to or associated with a present impression. This definition is crucial to understanding Hume's perspective, meriting a closer examination of its component parts. Hume defines impressions as all our sensations, passions, and emotions as they make their first appearance in the soul, and ideas as the faint images of these impressions in the thinking and reasoning. We can thus rephrase his definition as a lively image of thinking or reasoning which is related to a present sensation, passion, or emotion. According to Hume, then, people believe an idea not because of any inherently necessary rationale, but simply because of its liveliness when directly connected to their present impression of reality. This definition's implications for philosophical discourse are staggering. If belief is defined by present emotions, and reason merely represents these, how can knowledge founded on such belief be characterized as certainty? Far from philosophical arguments being characterized by inevitability, passion and perception make philosophy a rather arbitrary affair. Thus, all probable reasoning is nothing but a species of sensation. Here, Hume compares reason to direct sensation, just as one must taste a grapefruit to know its flavor. Since deduction will never convey what experience can, so rational knowledge is largely an experiential and not a deductive affair. Tis not solely in poetry and music we must follow our taste and sentiment, but likewise in philosophy. When I am convinced of any principle, Tis only an idea which strikes more strongly upon me. When I give the preference to one set of arguments above another, I do nothing but decide from my feelings concerning the superiority of their influence. Hume then argues that reason is furthermore not the cause of our actions. These two proceed from our passions, such as expectation of pleasure or pain. Mathematics do not cause people to build houses with right angles, but rather their desire for durable shelter incites them to make use of mathematical concepts. Hume even expands the scope of emotional motivation to include ethics. 
because nothing can oppose or retard the impulse of a passion, but a contrary impulse. Mere logic to the effect that evil is harmful will never cause a person to avoid doing evil. Rather, that person may instead start by desiring not to cause harm, in which case the rational conclusion that evil is harmful merely functions as a tool by which they fulfill their true ethical motivation, that is, their desire. According to Hume, then, philosophers such as Plato, who seek a rational basis for morality, are misguided, attempting to chart a path to the true and beautiful before they have established man's desire to travel to it. Consequently, Hume asserts that reason cannot even contradict or restrain passion. Since reason alone can never produce any action or give rise to volition, I infer that the same faculty is as incapable of preventing volition or of disputing the preference with any passion or emotion. Reason is and ought only to be the slave of passions. He argues that passion is simply a human condition, like sickness, hunger, or height, and hence cannot be opposed by reason any more than other such characteristics. Consequently, where a passion is neither founded on false suppositions, nor chooses means insufficient for the end, the understanding can neither justify nor condemn it. In short, a passion must be accompanied with some false judgment in order to its being unreasonable. And even then, tis not the passion, properly speaking, which is unreasonable, but the judgment. Platonic knowledge of abstract perfection is not sufficient in Hume's eyes to combat desire. Being almost as experiential as a grapefruit's taste, Passion is too immediate to be overruled, except by other passions. Big picture, then. Hume's greatest challenge to many prior Western philosophers is that they had mistaken reason for the cornerstone of the human psyche, whereas the principle underlying all thought and action ought to be acknowledged as sensation, emotion, <clears throat> and passion. So much for a summary understanding of Hume's work. What then are the strengths of his perspective? These can be summarized by describing Hume as the apostle of the heart enslaved. Again, contra Plato, Hume never sees the mind as able to escape the body's limitations, but always firmly bound to them. Jeremiah 17.9 observes, Bathea he cardia parapanta kai anthropos, estin kai tis gnosotaioton, Indeed, the darkness that human hearts are capable of is difficult to fathom, yet Hume advances our understanding further than most. He consistently exposes the fundamental nature of passion, sentiment, and appetite, how we are bound to our desires almost beyond all escape. He demonstrates the essential role that human finitude plays on philosophical thought, recognizing the subtle power of experience to create the illusion of absolute certainty. As a consequence of our finite nature, he also illustrates how the very structure of belief tends to undermine logical consistency and conviction. In all these observations, so challenging and convicting in their insightfulness, the Christian can readily recognize the fallen and finite condition of man made more clearly apparent. First then, Hume's critical perspective on human thought excels in exposing the fundamental nature of passion and present perception. On a biblical view of human nature, mankind after the fall has become self-seeking and marred by sin, including in areas such as knowledge, Romans 1.18 and following, and passion, as in Galatians 5.24. Further, man is clearly depicted as a finite creature, limited in understanding and ability. In this context, Hume's observations concerning reason are profoundly relevant to understanding how fallen creatures twist the truth and err rationally. Hume argues that reason is not unconnected to our selfish emotions and desires, but rather that what a person perceives as reasonable is contingent upon their emotions and perceptions. Perhaps this contingency is most evident in cases such as modesty or politeness, areas of Christian thought with little strict biblical guidance. 
and many differing opinions. Reason cannot be the most fundamental basis for belief, because first must exist a definition of what is rational. Thus, something prior to reason must predetermine reason's modus operandi. Hence, the mind is committed to a perception of truth before logic ever acts upon it. Hume posits that this perception is shaped by our impressions. When I feel rationally convicted of a proposition, Hume explains that I experience a correlation between my impressions and the proposition before me. Why, for example, is Euclidean geometry persuasive? Because it corresponds to my sense perception, but also because it fulfills my desire to understand reality, to see harmony between my mind's conclusions and external phenomena. Further, because geometry strikes me as beautiful, and my heart desires to see beauty in the world's structure. Thus, another plausible explanation of reality that leaves my desire to see correspondence between abstract and concrete unfulfilled, or strikes me as less aesthetically appealing, would seem to my mind irrational. Whether or not one agrees with these conclusions in detail, the point is this. What someone accepts as rational cannot be simplistically understood as impersonal, but rather must in some sense be affected by their current desires and impressions. In the context of a Christian perspective on philosophical thought, understanding passion and perception as fundamentally underlying rational thought is quite relevant to the issues of unbelief and self-deceit. Thus, when reading philosophers, the assumption that their arguments and conclusions can simply be taken at face value will all too often overlook a great part of their actual cognitive process. As set forth above, what human nature accepts as rational tends to be defined not by an unconcerned dialectic, by the disposition of the heart to base what it accepts as rational on its own desires and perceptions. This understanding of the heart's disposition is consistent with passages such as Romans 118 and following, which describes men rebelliously suppressing their knowledge of the truth in unrighteousness. Consequently, while the reasoning employed by a philosopher should be carefully studied in its own right, a holistic understanding of their thought cannot be attained without seeking to understand the perceptions and emotions underlying their argumentation. Men are not brains on a stick, nor are they limitless supercomputers transcendent of influence or boundary. Thus, to understand their thoughts, we must take into account the fact that they not only are, but cannot help but be, influenced by their impressions. In the fall, Eve was overcome by her sense perception of the fruit. Even the Psalms themselves are filled with earthly imagery and personifications of God. As finite creatures, we are limited by our passions and perceptions. We cannot reach beyond them without being pulled back and forced by our own natures to give them credence. When reading the philosophy of others or seeking to formulate our own, uh, to, approach humans, to approach human thought as a matter of unbiased logic overlooks the very nature of belief itself, as it inclines in fallen man towards the influence of the passions. Such an approach will ill-equip the believer to appreciate personal convictions or the work of a philosopher, no matter how the intellectual protests the contrary by claiming a prideful autonomy from the encroachments of passion. Secondly, Hume's critical perspective on human thought demonstrates the effect of human finitude on perception, particularly regarding experience's power to create the illusion of certainty. As noted above, human nature, being naturally finite, is subject to specific limitations, including an inability to think and understand clearly beyond impressions. Further, Hume argues it is impossible to prove a necessary logical connection between two objects, such that one is a cause and the other an effect. Your appeal to past experience decides nothing in the present case, and at the utmost can only prove that the very object which produced any other was at that very instant endowed with such a power, but can never prove that a like power is always conjoined with like sensible qualities. How, but by assumption, does seeing the sunrise guarantee one hundred times, sorry, seeing the sunrise one hundred times guarantee continuity on the hundred and first? According to their natural inability to think clearly beyond their impressions, people tend to believe that strong experiential patterns regulate future events. 
This bias towards personal experience is illustrated by the fact that, because all men could see the sun rising and setting every day, it took endurance against persecution for Galileo to persuade them that the earth actually goes around the sun. And while modern people can generally agree on observable scientific phenomena, non-experiential truths are often extremely 